Life Fiddle Church, today's scripture is from 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is God's word. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Martinez. I'm the student's minister here at Foothill, and uh, I'm so excited to be with you this morning and to bring the word. Uh, But before I do, I want to remind you uh, that tonight we're having a prayer night, uh, tonight at 8 o'clock on Zoom. Uh, So take a look out for, uh, for an email that should be coming your way to give you all the details. Uh, well, we're in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19, and uh, this, this passage is talking about suffering, talking about how to face suffering. And as I was studying this passage, it kind of reminded me um, from, from something as a kid. When I was a kid, I was really fascinated with the idea of survival. Uh, like what to do when you found yourself in certain uh, scary situations. It all stemmed from this book that I got uh, back in Book Bus, back in elementary school. I don't know if you had that. It was this random book, uh, bus that came, had all these books in there. And I saw this one book. It was something like uh, Survival Guide for Young Boys or something. Like all the things that young boys need to survive. And so, of course, it had pressing matters like, what to do in a shark attack, or what to do when you face quicksand. Uh, And what's funny is I still remember, and I still sometimes think about those things. Like I know now, chances are I'm probably not going to face a shark or quicksand, but I still have that stuff stored in my head. So for instance, when I do find myself face to face with a great white shark, what do I do? Well, I'm supposed to punch it in the nose or the eyes or the gills, supposed to get something kind of sharp and poke it. Uh, You're supposed to stay calm, don't splash around, because that makes it think you're injured like a seal. Uh, And if possible, take a scuba tank, put it in its mouth, and then shoot it. Uh, Or in in quicksand, what do you do when you get in the quicksand? Try not to struggle. In fact, you're supposed to try to get flat, kind of float, uh, spread out, uh, lower your mass, and then try to uh, grab onto a vine or something to pull yourself out. I have these things stored away, so I know what to do when quicksand hits. I'm ready. Um, But I realized recently When it comes to more realistic things like suffering, specifically suffering for maybe my faith or just suffering as a Christian, often I find myself totally flummoxed. And it's hit me, maybe I don't know how to deal with these situations well. Well, nearly the whole book of 1 Peter has been talking about suffering. For weeks now, we've been talking about different types of obstacles and and adverse situations and pain and suffering that maybe you've dealt with as a Christian. Peter says there's a lot of reasons that will suffer and what that's going to look like. And in chapter 2, he said, as a Christian, you may suffer because of authority. You're called to submit. Uh, In chapter 3, he said, you may suffer just for doing righteousness, just as Jesus did. In chapter 4, we see you may suffer from the culture. You may suffer from people like friends and family. Loved ones are going to oppose you because of your faith. And later we see you're going to suffer because of your own fallen nature. Because of your own temptations, you're going to suffer. Life on earth is going to be a constant battle with these old urges, and it's going to be hard. And if you're like me, maybe you face some of these adverse situations and you're not really sure how to deal with it. Maybe it's been confusing and painful. Well, what we have here in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19 is something really special and really helpful. A survival guide for suffering specifically for suffering when you come in uh, to suffering with your faith. And even bigger than that, this is a theology of suffering. What we have here is a passage saying, hey, Christian, this is how you should think about suffering. When you engage in that, this is going to prepare you. This is what you need to know. And so there's five things here that I think we can pull from the passage, five rules for suffering as a Christian that I want to look at. So rule number one is expect it. Expect it. 
See, we seek out comfort, uh, some better than others, right? Maybe you guys were here for the Father's Day thing uh, when we all got to dress up as like different stereotypes for fathers and I pulled the card where I was the, the lazy dad. So I got to get a robe and sit and have a cooler with Cokes and sit on a couch. Uh, I was not acting. That was like, it's kind of my natural habitat. I put a lot of effort into being comfortable. And that just makes sense, right? We're programmed for it. Because pain and friction, uh, the opposite of comfort, is usually a sign that things have gone wrong. Maybe you've worked out before and you've heard somebody say, hey, don't work out if this, if this thing causes you pain, right? If it makes you hurt, you shouldn't do it. Or maybe you're driving your car and you hear like a really weird noise. You should stop, right? Something in you tells you, oh no, something is wrong. When we come into contact with some kind of pain or suffering or friction, it's a warning us saying that, hey, something is wrong. You need to go the other way. Well, that's the opposite here for us. See, Peter is talking to people who are maybe surprised by their own suffering. He says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening. He's saying this is going to happen. This fiery trial that he's talking about could be in reference to the burning of Rome and the severe persecution that the Christians were facing. And some of these Christians here, maybe they were scared and shocked and surprised at the level of which they were suffering for Jesus. And Peter is saying, don't stop. You don't need to turn back. You don't need to change your tune. This is going to happen. And maybe you've gotten to that point yourself. Maybe you've gotten to the point where you started wondering, okay, is it supposed to be this hard? Look at the things he's mentioned. Maybe you've been chafing under uh, poor authority. Uh, Maybe you've been getting slammed lately for doing the right thing. Maybe you've been getting made fun of at work. Maybe you missed out on certain things. And maybe you've been really suffering, getting heat from people. You're speaking up against the culture and you're getting flack for that. Maybe you're facing these old temptations. You're facing things like anger and security and depression. And maybe you've just become exhausted. And maybe you're thinking, this is hard, especially in this really weird season we're in right now. And maybe you start to think, this is too much. Should there really be this much suffering? Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Doesn't God want me to prosper, to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous? Shouldn't things be easy? And Peter is saying, no. This is not surprising. If you're suffering for pursuing Jesus, don't stop. Don't consider it as something strange. This is natural. See, Peter understood this, I think, better than most. He understood this firsthand. Uh, In Matthew 16, Peter was a disciple of Christ, and Jesus had been doing his ministry for a while, right? He's been going around, been sharing the gospel, been doing these amazing, incredible things, and it was getting to the point that you couldn't ignore this Jesus character anymore. You couldn't just write him off as some loon. He was doing some really notable stuff. And so Jesus takes his disciples and he asks them, he says, hey, who do other people say that I am? And you get answers that aren't too different from today, like, oh, you're a good teacher, you're a prophet, Uh, you're a crazy person. And then Jesus asked Peter, well, Peter, who do you say that I am? And he actually, he asked the whole disciples. And I get this mental image there that all the disciples are kind of like, they're kind of bashful about it. You know, they're like, yeah, we we do kind of believe it. We do believe that Jesus is Lord, but I don't know. It still feels kind of like a weird thing to say. But then I get this idea that Peter stands up confidently and he says, you are Lord. You are God. You are Christ. And Jesus gives Peter a great response. Like Peter knows that was the right answer. Because Jesus says this to him in Matthew 16, 18 through 19. He says, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now that's some pretty great praise, right? That's pretty good news that Peter is hearing. That's an amazing moment for him. Uh, But if you have that open, you don't need to. But if you look down four verses later, you see Jesus seems to completely change his tune on Peter. He says, he actually calls Peter Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. And maybe you've heard that phrase before and you've kind of laughed at it. But I think most of us don't remember. This is just four verses after Jesus says this amazing stuff about Peter. So what happened? Did Jesus kind of lose it? Well, no, he was... He was explaining to his disciples the purpose. If you look at those four verses, Jesus talks to them and says, hey guys, this is what you need to expect. I am going to suffer. I am going to die on the cross. In fact, I'm going to suffer for the whole world, even though I've done nothing wrong. And Peter hears this, that Jesus is going to suffer, and that sounds insane to him. 
And he actually rebukes Jesus, the one that he just called Lord, the one that he just said, you're the Messiah. He rebukes Jesus. He calls him out. And then Jesus calls him out. He says, Peter, you don't get it. Peter is very surprised. He's like, you're Jesus, you're God. Why would you suffer? Jesus, you're good. You're God. You've done nothing wrong. Why would you suffer? Look, maybe this is new to you. Maybe you're you're a new Christian, or maybe you haven't really been um, living out your Christian life, or maybe you just haven't faced suffering yet. Maybe this is a confusing thing to you. Why do I have to worry about suffering? Why should I suffer? Well, Jesus promised this. He said, look, they hate me, and if they follow, and if you follow me, they will hate you. So be prepared, because to follow Jesus is to face suffering. We have to expect it. We have to be ready for it. Don't be surprised by it. Uh, So rule number two, what do we do when we face suffering? We rejoice when we suffer. Uh, Look at verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So Peter says, don't be surprised when you suffer as a Christian, but instead rejoice. Why? Why should we rejoice? Well, remember the context here. Remember who Peter is talking to. Uh, So most historians believe that Peter wrote this letter either right before or right after the great burning of Rome. Uh, and maybe you've heard this story, some consider it a, a legend, of, uh, of the crazy emperor Nero, who uh, he burned down Rome himself, right? He, wanted, he was crazy, he burned down the city of Rome, and maybe you've heard the legend that he played his fiddle while Rome burned. Uh, now, some argue uh, whether or not Nero actually caused the fire or whether he actually played the fiddle, but what happens next is not argued. See, the Roman people were devastated and destroyed by the destruction of that fire. Like, people were killed, uh, houses were burned down, lives were lost, the empire was crippled because of this fire. And Nero saw that people were angry. And so what he did is he blamed this on the Christians. The Roman people already didn't like Christians. There was already some uh, animosity there. But when, when he blamed that on the Christians, it started this 200-year-long era of massive persecution towards Christ and his church. And they faced gruesome ends. You maybe heard the stories. They were killed for sport. They would be burned alive as lanterns in Nero's garden parties. They would be crucified. And Peter is aware of all this suffering that's happening. And yet he tells them to rejoice. Why? And Peter explained this. He says, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Or you could say to the extent of which you suffer with Christ. This is what Peter's saying here. He's saying that we can rejoice when we suffer because that means we're sharing in Christ's suffering. When the Christians were getting beaten, beaten with rods, killed, put in front of people for entertainment, when they're getting killed for the name of Christ, they're suffering the blows that Christ would have suffered. It's the same with us. When we're insulted for his name, when we face ridicule, we face it because Jesus did and because we're following him. Look, I get it. None of us want to suffer. We don't want pain. But we all have something that we would suffer for, right? We all have something that we would sacrifice for. What is that for you? Maybe it's your career. Maybe you sacrifice everything to move up in your career. Maybe it's your family. Maybe you put your family above everything else. And maybe you would heroically and nobly say, I would die in a heartbeat for my family. I would take that punishment for my family. Christian, would you suffer for your Savior? Is he worthy of that for you? Is he worthy? But Peter goes on and see our reason for rejoicing, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop in just the the fact that we are sharing in the suffering with Christ. Not only do we share in his suffering, we share in his glory. He says, rejoice now that you might rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Here's the amazing truth about suffering. Suffering here on earth, suffering for Christ now is a reminder of what's to come. Christian, this is not the end. 
This life here on earth, although it seems long, the Bible says it is but a breath of vapor. This is not the end. The sufferings that we face here is nothing compared to the glory that we'll see, that we'll experience when Christ's glory is revealed. And he's saying when you suffer for him here, you experience it then. Even if we suffer the ultimate fate, even if we lose our lives, we have lost nothing because we gained Christ. So we have reason to rejoice. Even if your world is falling apart, even if everything is coming down on you, you know this is not the end. We will see Christ's glory revealed and we will share in that with them. We will be with them. But even more amazing, our reason to rejoice in suffering is not just in the future. Uh, look again at verse 14. He says, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You will be blessed because the Holy Spirit will rest upon you. Um, what, what does that mean? What does that mean that you will be blessed? Um, does it mean that you're going to feel good when you start getting insulted at work, when you start losing friends? Uh, no, it, it's not a feeling. Um, John MacArthur says this. He says, the blessing is not subjective happiness. It's the objective presence and power of the Holy Spirit. This is what he's saying. Okay, when this happens to you, when you face suffering, you're going to be blessed because the Holy Spirit will come upon you. It will rest upon you. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit rest upon you in times of suffering? It means that the dominant power of the Holy Spirit will be the thing sustaining you through this suffering. Have you ever heard stories of, of martyrs or persecution before and wondered how? How did they face these fascist regimes? How did they take this hate from the very people that they lived with that loved them? The Christians that Peter was writing to were subject to gruesome torture. How did they endure? How? How did they get through this? I've wondered this myself. I've, I've buckled before under, under peer pressure. Under, uh, I've had people ask me questions about my faith, and I've been afraid, and I've been ashamed, and I've wondered, how do these people stand up to much more difficult suffering? How do we do this? Well, they were blessed. The Spirit rested on them and brought them through it. It's like Stephen in Acts 7. He was stoned to death by the people, by his own countrymen. And in the end, he sees Christ and he cries out for this people. And he said, do not hold this against them. Many people who have faced suffering have said that the times that God's presence has felt strongest in their lives was in times of immense suffering. And although those times were the hardest moments in their life, they wouldn't take it back. Because it's that blessing that brings us through. So if you're insulted, you are blessed for the Holy Spirit will rest upon you and will bring you through this suffering. So that's rule number two. Rule number three, look at why you're suffering. Look at why you're suffering. I think we need to be careful here uh, when we talk about suffering. Because Christians are not the only ones who suffer. Uh, and suffering in and of itself is not inherently something that pleases God. In fact, there's going to be times in your life where you'll suffer where it is not honoring to God. Peter knows this, and he gives us an example in verse 15. He says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Uh, Peter's changing our perspective right now on suffering, right? Because like I said before, typically we'll do anything to avoid suffering because suffering is bad. And so maybe you're thinking, okay, all my suffering in my life is because uh, God is growing me, God is testing me, God is loving me, and this is glorifying God. However, you can bring suffering on yourself for foolish reasons. And that's, and that's bad. Christian suffering is because you follow Christ. It's not because you do something wrong or sinful or foolish. And so Peter lays out this list here. He says, yes, suffer for following Jesus, but don't suffer as a murderer for, because you murder people, right? If you go to prison, if you face hate for that because you murdered somebody, that is not glorifying to God. Don't suffer as a thief. Don't suffer as an evildoer. And then he goes, and then he says, don't suffer as a meddler. Peter's reminding us, he's saying, Christian, there's nothing noble about you getting a bad reputation from, your from the people around you because you do something like cheat on your spouse 
or because you're stealing or because you're causing uh, terrible things to happen or because you're just a rabble rouser getting in people's business. Just because you're a Christian does not mean that everything bad coming your way is because you're a Christian. Maybe you're a gossip. Maybe you're lazy. Maybe you have not been doing a good job at your work right now. And so you losing your job is not because of you being a Christian. It's because you haven't been a good steward of your time. And so when we face suffering, it's good for us to look and see, what is the cause of my suffering? Is it my own sin? Is it my own selfishness? Am I, am I being foolish here? Or is it truly because I'm following Christ? I think it's good for us to examine that, to keep short accounts. And, and now look at this. I think this is really interesting. Peter uses these really specific accusations. Um, why would he say this stuff? Was he just kind of pulling things out of thin air? Uh, Mark Dever talks about this, and I, and I think what he says makes sense. I think he's talking about things that Christians were already getting accused of. He said, don't be accused of as a murderer. We talked about this before. The, the practice of communion was really weird to people back then, and maybe weird to people now. Uh, pagans, if you weren't a Christian, you weren't allowed to join in this practice, and so people started telling rumors about it, right? You're eating flesh and blood. That must mean you're a cannibal. That must mean you're killing people. And so they would call them murderers and cannibals and have them suffer for it. And then thieving. He said, don't suffer as a thief. They heard about offering. And so like, are they stealing things from people? Evildoer. Christians thought that, or people thought that Christians hated humanity because they didn't worship idols, which is seen as a cultural celebration. They opposed the culture. They were the conscience to the culture. They would stand up and say, that thing that you're doing is wrong. This cultural practice is not right. The way this nation is headed is evil. And so people would call Christians bigots and say they were evil. And then meddler. I'd say, are you, are, if you're a Christian, that must mean you're a meddler. You're getting in the way of people's lives. And so what's today's version of that, I guess? These are the accusations laid at Christians' feet. Maybe some of them are true. Maybe some of them weren't. And so what is today's accusations of Christians? What is the media's representation of a Christian? Right? How are they viewed in today's culture? Um, maybe, they're, maybe they're mean. Maybe they're, they're kind of dumb. Maybe they're kind of closed-minded. Maybe they're judgmental. And I think what Peter is saying for us here is, hey, these are the stereotypes laid at Christians. And a lot of them, they're, they're unfair. But these are the stereotypes. Don't live down to those stereotypes. If you're a Christian, and if it's well known that you're a Christian, then don't suffer uh, as someone being judgmental because you're judgmental. Don't suffer as someone who is uh, not generous, as someone who is hard, as someone who is not loving, not kind, because those things are true of you. He's saying, look at the reason why you're suffering. Is it because of your own sin, or is it because you're bringing glory to him? Suffering wrongly brings shame, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. I, what's interesting here is that the name Christian at that time didn't mean what it does today. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's our religion. We call ourselves Christians. But back then, the word Christian was a derogatory term. Christians wouldn't call themselves Christians. In fact, it was an insult if somebody called you a Christian. That's not the name they called themselves. They would make fun of them. They were belittling, belittling them. They'd say, oh, you just want to be like a little Christ, huh? And Peter is saying, don't be ashamed when they call you a Christian. Don't be ashamed of the ways you suffered for living out the gospel. Instead, glorify God in that name. Take that shame and use it for God's glory. And quickly, how do we do that? How do we glorify God in our suffering? Well, I want you to remember that when you're suffering, very rarely are you suffering privately. Maybe there's things in your life that aren't you know, public on, on the surface, but people can tell, people know when you're going through something. Whatever it is, maybe it's a sickness or maybe it's a hard thing at work, whatever is going on, you're suffering Somebody's probably seeing that. And so how can we glorify God in our suffering as we suffer publicly? Our suffering can be an example. It can be a, a smooth song for other people. In fact, we've heard stories of people giving their life to Christ because they saw Christians suffer and suffer well. They glorified God in their suffering. Uh, let, let's move to, to, to rule four. So rule number four, how do we face suffering? We look ahead. Look at verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? 
One of the best ways to ease the pain of suffering in your life is to have an eternal perspective. To stop looking at just what's happening here and now, but to look in the big picture, the big biblical picture of what is happening. And that's what Peter's doing here. He's saying, yeah, we're suffering, but look, judgment is coming. And present suffering marks the beginning of the final judgment. And so he says this to Christians. He's like, guys, you are going to suffer here on earth. It's going to happen. But then he kind of takes a sidestep and he directs our attention away from us and our suffering. And then he looks at everybody else, the non-Christians. And he says, even these ones who may be causing our pain, he says, what about the ones who don't know God? Our suffering will end, but theirs will not. And he hearkens back to Proverbs 11.31. That's why it may be indented a little bit differently in your Bible. In that verse, it says this, if the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner. So this is what he's saying. He's not saying that we need to worry as Christians about our salvation. What he's saying is Christian, yeah, it's a hard life. No question. It is a hard life to be a Christian. That's why the prosperity gospel is so evil and misleading because it hides us from that truth. It is hard. But listen, our peace is coming. We have satisfaction and peace in Christ now, but our ultimate peace and glory is coming. But now, what about the people who don't know Jesus? That's not the case for them. Suffering and the end and punishment and judgment is coming for those who don't know Christ. And maybe you know those people. Maybe those people are the same ones who are causing you pain. And so Peter says, instead of being focused on our own pain, we should see our suffering as a reminder to serve and preach the gospel. Look at Peter, look at Paul when they were in prison, when they were getting beaten. They didn't respond in anger. They responded with the gospel. And some of those people's lives changed. And so Christian, that's our call for us. When you're suffering, when you're facing hate for uh, for being a Christian, when you're facing that, that friction there, remember that is your opportunity to share the gospel because your peace is coming and maybe, maybe theirs is not. So let's end with this, the the, the final point. What do we do? What are our rules for survival when we face suffering, especially facing it for our faith? Uh, And our last point is this, you trust the faithful creator. Look at verse 19. Therefore, and he kind of ends it all here. He says, because of everything I said, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So final rule for suffering as a Christian, entrust your soul to the faithful creator. Um, that word entrust there uh, in the Greek is a, is a banking term. It means to deposit something like in a good bank or maybe like in a really good investment, a good stock. And so the idea here is take your soul and entrust it, deposit it in a place where it will be safe. It will be protected in a place where it will be invested, where it will grow. Don't just hold it. Don't worry in this time of trial and suffering. Entrust your life to God. Suffer for his sake because you know that he is there. Look, as rational as we try to be, sometimes it's helpful to just have a hug and have somebody say, hey, it's going to be okay. Somebody who cares about you. And in a sense, I think that's kind of what Peter is doing here. He's saying, Christian, don't give up. I know this is hard. I don't know what, where you are in your life right now. I don't know what's going on, but I know that you're facing, if you're a Christian, you're facing trials. Somebody once said, if you're a Christian, you're either about to enter in a storm, you're in a storm, or you're just leaving a storm. The Christian life is a life full of trials. And it's good for us to remember, we're not doing this for nothing. We're entrusting our soul into the faithful creator. He knows your needs because he created you. And so we can entrust our life to God in the midst of our greatest suffering. Look, we know the suffering that we face here is nothing compared to what will come. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you you are good. You are a good God. Father, I want to pray for those who are are suffering in some sense right now. All of us are kind of, all of our lives are thrown in in a weird way right now because of the virus. But there's some of us who are facing um, real suffering, real questions, real hurt. And Lord, I pray that this message would be an encouragement. God, I pray that we could take your word, that we could hide it in our heart, that would be helpful. I pray that we would remember that your glory, God, is very, very real. 
that the suffering we face here is nothing compared to what it will be when we're finally there with you. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen.